All right, as we begin this, make sure you understand that this is a very brief description or discussion of the political philosophy that the founders had, or at least at the time of the founding of the country, the writing of the Declaration, the forming of the U.S. Constitution. This is not meant to be extensive, but what you might find is that a lot of this is useful, um, especially when you get into high school or into college if you begin to continue to study politics. So I think it's important to note um, at the beginning of this that the, the time period we're talking about really is the Enlightenment. It's the end of the Enlightenment. It's coming to an end. And the reason why this is important is because the founders were people that really did understand that you could use reason to solve problems. And in particular, they were incredible students of history. And they believed that by studying history and the circumstances surrounding historical events, we could really begin to understand what we needed to do in forming our own government. Remember, the war has ended. It's time to create our country. And you can't just simply say, oh, we are the United States. You have to form a government. So these things here are meant to help us understand what their thoughts were about human nature, human beings, history, and how this government should be formed. Their focus is going to be this guy right here, John Locke. And we've talked about him before. He is the author of this book right here, this tre second treatise on government. And there, he's, he's a great influence. And, and in fact, I think it's a wonderful book to read. It's pretty heady stuff. But in it, you're going to find a discussion of these two topics. We're going to start with these two ideas, natural rights and natural law. Now, I think that we've, uh, we've already discussed natural rights to a great extent. And I think that there are a few ideas to remember about natural rights. Okay. The first thing is that natural rights are, um, that they are what we call, uh, what we say is that they cannot be, be taken away. Secondly, we say natural rights are rights that don't come from government. So not government, but they come from the creator. And then the third thing is that we, um, we describe natural rights, and really John Locke describes them this way, but then we also see this in the Declaration of Independence, that there are basically three examples of natural rights that we need to remember. Life liberty and property, life, liberty, and property. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. John Locke also describes what we call natural law. And he says that it is by or with reason that human beings can understand natural law or what was called in the Declaration of Independence, the laws of nature. He says, by observing your environment, by observing uh, nature itself, the trees, the birds, the animals, and so on, but also by observing other people, what you can see is that there are certain laws at work among people. And he's, he describes these laws as universal and as unchanging. He says, these laws apply to all men. That's what it means to be universal. Every man in the world, every person in the world, every single person in the world, not just in certain countries or certain places or certain cultures, but every single person understands that there are certain laws at work among people. And he says, these laws are unchanging. It doesn't matter if you go back a thousand years, those laws still exist. It doesn't matter if you go forward a thousand years, those laws still exist. And probably the best example of a law that exists that is universal, everyone believes it, and unchanging, it's always been this way, is the law against murder. That murder is wrong. Locke would say, look, at, there's never been a time when murder was good or the right thing to do. 
there's not a society where it's considered an acceptable form of behavior. And you can make all kinds of arguments against that and give all sorts of exceptions to the rule. But the reality is this, that in those situations where it might appear that murder is acceptable or the right thing to do, very often that group of people, that culture doesn't see that behavior as murder. Let me give an example. Cannibalism. Cannibals believe that killing other people and eating them is acceptable. Now, do you think that when they kill other people and, 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 uh, and they eat them that they consider it murder? Absolutely not. They consider it hunting. And so in that way, they don't, they don't violate the natural law. They abide by it. The reason why Locke brings these two subjects up is because from the natural law or the laws of nature, as it says in the Declaration, our natural rights become very evident. And here's how that works. There is this law against murder. We just said that. And that law implies that, that we have a right to something. And that something is, of course, A little bit of a mess, a mix up there. So it implies we have a right to. life. Now, we also know that there are natural laws against the ideas of stealing, right? It makes sense that there would be a law against stealing, that taking something that doesn't belong to you is something that has always existed as a natural law that people have always understood in all cultures that taking stuff that's not yours is wrong. Well, that's because there is a, a, an existing right to property that exists. Now, you might think that, well, that describes two of them, but, you know, is that all there is? Well, no, there's more. And how do we know there's more? Well, for instance, in the Declaration of Independence, there's a phrase in the second paragraph. It says that there are these things, these unalienable rights. And then it says that among these are And by saying among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it implies that there are rights beyond those three, that there are other rights maybe that are not mentioned in the Declaration of Independence that would be considered natural rights or, or unalienable rights. As Americans, we typically understand that those, those other rights besides those three are found in the Bill of Rights. And what's really neat about the Bill of Rights is the Bill of Rights doesn't say, well, it's just the first 10 amendments, right? It doesn't say when you get to number 10, that's it. As a matter of fact, the Ninth Amendment, obviously, which is in the first 10, the Ninth Amendment says pretty much the same thing as this among. The Ninth Amendment of the Constitution says there may be other rights that the people believe they have. And so by listing these, this Bill of Rights, these 10 amendments, don't assume that that means that that's all there is. There are others beyond that. John Locke goes on to describe something known as the state of nature. And it's important to realize that the state of nature is an imaginary state. It's an imaginary situation. In this imaginary situation, John Locke says that there are there is no government and there are no laws. There are no rules. Come on, let your mind go wild. What would you do if there were absolutely no rules whatsoever of any kind? Well, you would have absolute freedom, wouldn't you? And he says in this situation where there's absolute freedom, one of the things that's going to happen is that well, people will have their rights violated.
And I think it's pretty obvious to say that you would have probably have your rights violated on a daily basis, that someone would want to steal your stuff, uh, beat you up, et cetera, or even kill you. And it would be a, a regular thing and a, a, a very common thing. In other words, a state of nature is not a, a situation that anybody really wants to live in. No one's going to feel safe. But he says, remember, this is an imaginary situation. But he says, you know, if we watch human beings, one of the things we know that happens is human beings very often, even within groups of people that where, there, where government doesn't exist. So imagine, for instance, all of your friends sitting out there in the quad at lunch. You know, there's this big, giant group of people. There's always somebody in charge. There's always somebody who's kind of giving orders to the rest of the people. And this by nature happens in groups of people. There's always somebody who's the leader, the person in charge. And he says, in a state of nature, what's curious is that the people that are the strongest, the people that are the smartest, these people are going to be in control. They're going to be able, because they have absolute freedom, to take their strength, to take their smarts, and basically abuse the other people, take their stuff, kill them, enslave them, etc. And he says that in this situation, people won't stand for it very long. He says the reason why it never really existed is because people won't allow it. Now, not that they won't allow it at all, but they won't allow it long before they want it changed. And here's the way it basically works. You imagine yourself in a situation, a large group of people, and there's one person in that group that is abusing your rights all the time. They are stealing your stuff and they're beating you up and then maybe they're even killing some of your friends once in a while. And so what happens one day is that you and your you and all the people that are in this group get together and you say, you know what, we're not going to stand for it anymore. This person who's been abusing our rights, we're going to get rid of this person. And when you do that, when you actually agree with your other the other people within your community to get rid of the problem, to get rid of the person who's abusing their rights, John Locke says, in that situation, what you literally do is you form government. And what you're literally going to do with your friends or your people or the people in the community is you're going to say to them, look at, we can't put up with this guy anymore. And, and I promise all of you that I will um, not violate your rights if you won't violate my rights. If you will not kill me, I'll not kill you. If you won't steal my stuff, I won't steal your stuff. And if we all work together, we can get rid of that guy and we can then be safe. And in a real sense, Sean Locke says, that's what government is. It's when people band together to protect their natural rights. That's the purpose of government, is to protect people's natural rights. And he uses this state of nature to explain the process. And he says, it's a very natural one. People do this automatically. They don't have to be told. They don't have to think long about it. They do it naturally. And he says government is a very natural outgrowth of the human condition. It's a very natural part of being human is to have this idea of government. Now, John Locke doesn't just simply say, oh, they form a government. He actually calls it something. He gives it a name. He says it's a social compact. This is the agreement. In a literal sense, this is a contract. And Locke points out that when government is formed in this social compact by these people in the state of nature, they agree to three things. They agree to number one right here, which I'm going to tell you in just a moment. They agree to number two. They sign to or they agree with the social compact. And number three, they are going to agree to live under the laws that are created by that social compact. What goes on that blank? That's really important. 
Well, if we go back and look at the state of nature, one of the things we remember is that you had absolute freedom in a state of nature to do whatever you wanted. And so what John Locke says is that when you form your social compact and you say to your friends or your, your, your community members, hey, I won't kill you if you won't kill me. I won't steal your stuff if you won't steal mine. What you're really, really agreeing to do is you're agreeing to give up some of your freedom. Not all but some of your freedom. You give up the freedom to kill people, steal stuff, etc. when you sign the social compact. Because you're living under the laws and you have to obey the laws, otherwise you get punished. And why do you do that? Why do you agree to these things? Well, Locke says it's simple because your number one goal is to be safe. Your number one goal is to make sure that you're not living in you know, perpetual fear. This way you can be sure that your natural rights get protected. You can see down here that this is talked about. This agreement among themselves is made to protect their natural rights. They avoid a state of nature. They have to give up some of their freedom. Right. They consent or agree to follow the laws and in that way they get protection. This is the whole idea behind the, the social compact. And so what John Locke has explained and what the founders firmly believe is that it is a very natural and human process to create a thing called government. And people do it for one simple reason. They do it to have their natural rights protected. And so their goal was to create a government that did exactly that, that protected their natural rights. Well, what kind of government would be best for that? And John Locke argues, and the founders agree, that the best form of government for that was something we call Republican government. So it's the best to protect people's natural rights. And this is a government where citizens, remember, they elect, oops, they elect representatives. Those representatives then make decisions for them. But what's important here, remember, is that the representatives that these people choose are people that just like them. They're people that live in this government and they live under the laws. And so what's important is that in a, in a Republican government, those representatives must follow the law, just like everybody else. The founders then went on to say, look, at it's important that we understand one other aspect of this, that Republican government really isn't possible unless people have what's called civic virtue. Now, what is civic virtue? Listen to this little story. There's this guy by the name of Cincinnatus in the Roman Empire. He's a former general, now a farmer. And he decides that he is going to um, you know, stay a farmer for the rest of his life. He's retired. In Rome, there's this rule that says, in the government, that says, if there is an imminent threat to the, to the empire, um, a threat from outside, an invasion that may absolutely crush the empire and be the end of the Roman Empire, that the Roman government had the right to hand all of their power to one person. In other words, create a dictator in order to save the empire. And so there was a threat. Cincinnatus was handed all the power, and Cincinnatus went off as the general, and he kept Rome safe. He, he re re repelled the, the invader, and they was sent them back to wherever they came from. Rome also knew very often, though, when they handed a person power like that, they very often didn't get it back, that that person would end up becoming a dictator and keeping that dictatorship until he died. Turned out, though, that Cincinnatus, when the, when the whole threat was, up, was ended, Cincinnatus handed the power back to the Roman Senate and went back to being a farmer. 
In other words, Cincinnatus was an individual who believed in a couple of things. And this is these are examples of what we call civic virtue. He was a hard worker. He was a farmer, a general, and back to being a farmer again. He believes in hard work. Right? He believes in service. He goes off and serves his country. He comes back when he's done serving his country. Okay. But he also believes in something else. He believes that his service should not be to his own benefit. That service was not about him. then in a sense, there's one thing he can't be. He can't be selfish. He can't be thinking about himself. And so the founders believed that Republican government only would work if we had people that were the representatives. These are representatives that we elect. If they're hard workers, they believe in service. They believe that the service shouldn't be for their own benefit. And that it's temporary. That service is not something that goes on and on and on and on. Now there is, and this is kind of a final note, there is another philosopher that was looked at by the founding fathers. And this is this guy by the name of Montesquieu. And Montesquieu was a, uh, a French philosopher at the time. You'll notice the dates there. He dies actually right before the American Revolution. This is a quote by Montesquieu in one of his books called The Spirit of the Laws, read by a lot of people that study history and politics. And he says, it is necessary from the very nature of things. You notice that phrase, from the very nature of things. Again, the idea of natural law, natural rights. And he says, here's what's very obvious to him, that power should be a check to power. Remember the state of nature? We said that there was the power of the one, the bully, that would be checked by the power of the many, the people that bound together in the social contract, that power must be used to check power. Now, what this implies is that there are powers within government. Government has power. We know that. We also know that government, basically, the government powers are broken into three different types of power or what we would call three branches. And so one of the things that we credit Montesquieu with is the idea that there needs to be a separation of power in government. Not like a king where there is one person with all the power, but more of a separation of power that enables the one, one power, one branch to check the power of the other branches. And in this way, he says, this will prevent tyranny. You need to know what tyranny is. Tyranny is when you get your natural rights abused. And we want to prevent that.